Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Ryan Hawk. He is a keynote speaker, advisor, and author of the new book, Welcome to Management. He's also the host of The Learning Leader Show, which is a podcast named on Inc. Magazine's list of five podcasts to make you a smarter leader. He's also the head of Brixey and Myers Leadership Advisory Practice. Ryan, I'm so thrilled to get to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Katie, I'm pumped to be here. I appreciate uh, you having me excited for all the good stuff that you're doing. Yes, I think, you know, we met about a year ago and I learned more about, I've been, you know, been listening to your podcast longer than that, but we, uh, I got to learn more about some of the keynote speeches that you give and some of the workshops that you host. So tell us more about your passion for leadership and, and why that is the thing that sort of sets you on fire. Well, I, I've, I would um, for me, it's because primarily that I was lucky to be led by incredible leaders from a very young age, starting with my mom and dad, and and they're still doing that to this day, as well as, uh, as two particular coaches in my life w- played leadership roles, Bob Gregg and Ron Ollery, uh, my football coaches in high school, which... Uh, I first l- truly learned the power and the value of leadership and seeing those two guys use their power for good really inspired me to try to to have a similar impact on other people as I grew up and matured. And so once I got left the world of playing sports and, and transitioned into the business world, I, I wanted to see if there was a way I could have that type of impact on other people. Uh, and and so that's why I've been so passionate about both studying excellent leadership and then trying to practice it myself to help others. And and that's a, that that is a big reason why my podcast, The Learning Leader Show, exists and has for the past five years is because that's what I am truly most passionate about. Whether it's leading in the business world or even more importantly, leading my household as a husband and a dad. And uh, it really translates into all worlds. And, 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 and that's why I love it so much. It's incredible, isn't it? How th- sometimes the most unassuming people in our lives become the most influential. It's true. Uh, it, it really is. And uh, I've, I've got to, to, to feel that firsthand. And so I'm, I'm, I, I hope to, to, to do the same for others now. And I think just, just as you do, it's it's exciting, it's fulfilling, it's gratifying, it, 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 it lights you up. And I think that's, uh, that's really the, the fun part about all of this. So we'll get to talk about innovation together in particular in a little bit. But first, I want to start with the concept of leadership and its relationship to storytelling. Can, can you share some of your thoughts around why stories matter as, as someone enters into the realm of leadership? Well, I think of one of my favorite bosses of all time. Uh, he's actually my boss's boss, so I haven't worked directly for him, but his name is Brian Miller. And one of the reasons that I thought Brian was so effective was that he always started each of our meetings or our or our town halls with a story. And the story was typically picked up over the course of his uh, knowledge gathering, uh, whether it's reading books or articles or watching TED Talks. And he would take a, a story, let's say it even as of, uh, I remember one specifically was of a golfer, a golfer named Webb Simpson. And Brian told us how Webb increased his scoring by just half a stroke from one season to the next. And then he showed the difference of where he ranked on the top 100 golfers list. And he and he inc- improved dramatically just, just by that simple half stroke improvement. And then he related it to our world. And at this time I was a sales professional. He was able to relate that then to our world and how we could implement some of the same behaviors that Webb Simpson did on the golf course, but then do it in the world of professional selling. And at that point, I realized that Brian had this magic skill to go out and be a consumer of knowledge, distill that knowledge and those stories down to its essence, retell them to all of us, and then most importantly, create some sort of practical application. So we remember the story, and then we also remembered how to implement into our daily lives based upon the stories that he told. 
So instead of him standing up there and sharing the numbers of the last quarter and the numbers of the future quarter and saying, we must hit this goal. He found a way to, to pull from real life stories. I still remember this was over let's say 10 years ago now, Katie, it's pretty crazy. And I still remember that specific story and how it impacted me. And so when I saw a guy like Brian Miller doing that, I thought I need to work on and develop that same skill of being able to tell stories and then relate them to the people that I'm leading. Yeah, I think about it's so true, isn't it? Every really powerful mentor in my life, every you know really great boss or mentor has had that ability to tell stories that help me relate to where they were at that time in their lives related to a time that I have been in my life and a a challenge that I've faced. And it's powerful when humans can do that, when we can connect to one another like that. And yet it can be really challenging for a lot of us to, it's almost like a level of bravery to sort of, and a memorization challenge, I think, for a lot of people to kind of store stories in our minds. How, how like do you that. Do, I'm curious how do you as a professional storyteller, like how do you do this? Like do you have a process in place to have a bank of stories and to know when to go into that bank and pull them out, whether it's in the written word or spoken? Like is do you have I'm curious about this because I'm always working on trying to to do this better. Yeah, absolutely. Repetition matters deeply. Yeah. Um yeah. but but also listening and being able to adjust your story with feedback that you're getting from different listeners and from different stakeholders. I think one of the best strategies comes from ancient Greece, uh, where oration was everything. And okay, so you have to forgive me for getting nerdy for just a minute, right? Because this is like my PhD in rhetoric. So here we go. (laughs) Let's let's go back to the grad school days. But uh, but, but yeah, so oration was everything in that culture. They didn't even have writing. And so one strategy that orators would use at that time was they would go into a building or a space and they would speak different lines of their monologue or their script, if you will, their story in different sections of the building. And so you'd stand in one corner and look at the environment. You'd kind of get a visual for where that, what that space looked like. There might be something hanging on the wall. There might be a cup in the corner, right? And you'd sort of see those objects and you would speak the first few lines. Then you would physically move to a different part of the room, and you'd be looking at a, a different, you'd be looking at a, a seat, for instance, and you would speak the next few lines, and you would physically move throughout the building different levels, different floors, different objects that you're looking at, and you would memorize your entire speech that way. And Wow. Yeah. So they, they had a deep respect for space and visual cues to help us memorize. And so I like to use that. that that's one fun practical pro tip, I guess, is uh, try to practice speaking different sentences or different stories in uh, different spaces so that you can kind of create a pattern. And, and it's sort of a way to recall as you're then telling the story, you'll recall where you were when you said those words. Hmm. And I just feel like what it gets back to, though, is it's not necessarily sexy, but the repetition is so important of practice, rehearsal, uh, continuously doing it over and over and over. And I know the difference between when I prepare and when I rehearse versus when I don't, it's noticeable. Yeah. Even if I've even if I've already given a keynote that's going to be a similar message a hundred times. I still know I'm going to be better on that stage in front of all of those people if I'm in my hotel room doing practicing, getting the reps, telling the stories, using emotion, uh, understanding the highs and lows of your voice, uh, reading the audience, like which is hard to do on your own, but it's but it's being mindful of that. And I, I just find that I take that from the sporting world too, is that the value of being overly prepared for the moment so that when you do get on stage or something may happen that uh, was unexpected, you're prepared because you've got your material down cold and that comes from, from proper preparation. Yes, yes, exactly. I, and I, I appreciate the athletic metaphor because, okay, get, getting even a step nerdier here, the orators at, at the time would also go to these schools where their athletics were just as central and important as the art of oration. And so they would mm-hmm. literally go from wrestling to their next activity, which would be practice for speech. And, and so really physicality and your physical environment and muscle memory was something that was deeply understood and felt 
felt back then. And I think it's important, you know, we have a lot of technological tools now to help us memorize, right? We can write things down. There's paper, there's com- <laughs> there are computers, there's text. And if you're a visual person, being able to sort of see the words, some people, you know, memorize and and, and really work through how to say things in different ways by, by creating different variations of your talking points on, on, on a text screen, right? And, um, and for some of us, it's really about coming up with visual cues. But uh, I completely agree with what you're saying, that it is about muscle memory and getting those reps in matters. Yeah, no, no doubt. No doubt about it. I think that it, it's like anything uh, that you're going to do. Um, if it's important to you, then, then, then get the repetitions and leading up to it because that, that being overly prepared, there's no downside. I mean, there just really yes. isn't, whether it's a podcast, it's a speech, um, it's writing, right? That's why writers have to write every single day, not just, oh, I have a writing project. It's time to start writing. It's like, no, that's, that's part of my regular routine is that I'm a writer. And so I have to write every day. And I think all, all of those reps matter. Yes, exactly. You know, something else, too, that I think is really important as we think about stories is to be able to empathize with many different viewpoints and voices. It's really good habit to start telling stories that aren't only yours. Mm. So being able to say, here's something that I heard from our head of operations, or here's something that uh, I heard from one of our, you know, customer service reps, and here's her perspective on it. And creating, really, I think, being able to increase diversity and inclusion um, by by giving voice to the perspectives of people who aren't only going to use cultural references that are the same as yours, or because you know that's how we that's how we. Change organizational cultures and make sure that there's not uh, sort of just only the same types of metaphors or references getting circulated, which can kind of inadvertently make uh, people who might feel outside of that, you know, racial or gender identity or cultural reference feel uh, excluded. It, and sometimes that's it's not intentional, but it can happen. And so I, I think using our power of storytelling to lend voice to others and um, or to invite others, especially when you're in a leadership position, to open up um, in a way that aligns with the values that you want to spread, right, or that aligns with the mission that you're trying to, to lead against. But um, um, inviting other voices onto that stage with you and uh, and really giving the opportunity for diversity to be a habit, something that's c- completely uh, saturated, if you will, throughout your organization. Sure. And it probably also creates a uh, greater perspective for you as a leader to put yourself in the shoes of that person, as well as empathy and compassion, which are two great qualities of, of effective leaders. Is, and so if you, if, you, if you create a habit of working to tell other people's stories or others or, or think of it from their perspective, I don't see any, again, I, I see only upside in putting yourself in that position on a regular basis. Yeah, I love that point. Yeah, really, empathy is another. You know, talk about getting your reps in. It really <laughs> is about practice and uh, and reminding yourself every day, like my opinion's not the only one that matters, and my voice and and my power can be used to uh, uh, lift up others. Right. So. Yeah. 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 yeah good stuff. Yeah. So t- tell me more about your new book, Welcome to Management. <laughs> well. Uh, it was really written for myself, um, and, and because I remember the leap I made from individual contributor to manager, and it's I think especially where I was in corporate America, it was a gigantic leap that I was ill prepared to make, and most people are, in fact, because you focus so much on being excellent at your current role as an individual, at least I did, I guess I should speak for myself, but I've seen others who have dealt with this, that you focus on that, but then you realize, and then, and because you do well at that, it gives you the opportunity to get, to interview for these bigger roles uh, and leadership positions to be a manager. Yet the skills that it takes to be successful as an individual contributor and the skills it takes to be successful leading others, very few of them are the same. And so you get promoted for the work that you did in the past that doesn't have very much to do with the work you're going to do in the future. And so you're not really ready to go. And I wrote the book that I needed to have when I made that first jump because unfortunately, I was one of those bad bosses, bad <laughs> managers that my initial, my initial uh, professionals had to deal with for a period of time. And 
didn't really fully know what I was doing. I had a great boss, but he also had a lot going on. Um, and so I needed to figure some things out and, uh, I, I, I could have used some sort of manual or a guide, um, in order to help me do that better. And so I tried to, to, to write that guide now that many years have passed. And I've also spoken with more than 350 of the most thoughtful leaders and, and, and borrowed from some of their wisdom, mashed it together with my experience and my learnings, and then, and then produced it in a, in a 60,000 plus word book. Um, and so that's my hope is Katie, that, that literally every person who gets, promoted from that individual contributor to manager role gets a big congratulations pat on the back and handed this book <laughs> yes. um, that I could help them do a much better job than I did when I first got promoted. I, I love your personal story and the way that you relate it to, you know, what what sparked you to write this book and, and take on these topics and, and all of the content that you're creating. And, you know, the book is relevant to all business sectors and all business sizes and, and, and individuals within those positions, right? Because management stretches across all aspects of, of what uh, professional trajectories can look like. But I want to speak specifically to the startup community a little bit because management is something that in the startup world, it can hit fast when when a startup changes and it starts to gain momentum and it starts to grow and higher. And sometimes those companies are experiencing, you know, 300 percent or 500 percent or 800 percent year on year growth. And they're expected to also people who were really the idea people in the beginning and working with a small team of three or four or five people where individual contributions are really everything and that's all you need to run a solid show. Once you start to scale rapidly, the demand to take on a different identity as a manager and a leader, that shift can be very rapid for people who are in high growth startups. Can you speak a little bit to, I mean, I know that for me personally as a startup founder, that's something that I've experienced and I'm sure I'll continue to learn from. Um, it, it, now I'm in a position of trying to coach the rest of you know, the, my, my next uh, group of uh, you know, people in the company to start thinking of themselves as managers and as leaders so that we can continue to scale. It's it's really for the for startups in particular, it's really critical to scale that our the people making up our company are viewing themselves as managers and it's a way of positioning those startups to dream bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a big challenge because you go from just being the doer of the work to now leading others to do the work. Um, and so your job is just a dramatic change, is a dr- dramatic transition that sometimes isn't, um, it's not always timed properly, or maybe you don't necessarily want to, but in order for the business to grow and be successful, that's what needs to happen. And, and so that's why I think it's, wor- it's, it's a worthy cause to study and understand how to be an effective leader, how to understand, to um, inspire people and empower people to do their ultimate best work and, how the, and, and also the fact that each and every person on your team, Katie, has a different personality, has a different motivation internally. They have a different why for, for why they're doing what they do. And as the leader, it is our job to understand what that is to help unleash those people to do their ultimate best work for the betterment of both themselves as well as your organization, your company. And that takes a lot of time. That takes effort. That takes careful thought. It takes reflection. Um, it, and most importantly, it takes you deliberately caring deeply about, about each of those people because they certainly don't care how much you know unless you they know that you care and um i I found that uh, putting all of that together is much easier said than done the execution of all of that is a daily battle um in order to stay on top of it and to lead with trust which is the foundation of all relationships and 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 doing that though uh, is hard as you're also trying to think kind of top line businessy type terms as well as you have to combine that with leading actual people and uh, that's that's the challenge of doing what you do. That is, it's so incredibly true. And so much of it, I think, to that transition, it's really a, a strange mindset shift where before um, you might have been 
rewarded. Uh, you might be rewarding yourself, you know, it, it, through, it, through positive internal messages inside your head that, um, and also from your own management at, at the beginning, or, or in the case of a startup, from from clients or uh, from investors. That you know, good job, you hustled, right? Like you did the work. You're you're the doer, and transitioning from that into scaling what it is that you just did into a process that can be reliable or into um, the ability to support other individuals to run a process or bring their creativity to to hand. That is such a different mindset. It's, it's an, I'm really grateful that you've written this book because it, it seemed, it, it's really helping us pay attention to how how strange a, a, of a shift that really is for so many people, especially when we reward ourselves and are rewarded in companies for being able to do the work really, really well by ourselves. And that's oftentimes the reason why someone gets uh, identified for a management promotion, right? But then ironically, it's also the challenge of sort of getting out of that mindset and saying, oh, now it's my job to empower other people and help them get rec the recognition and the reward for the hard work. It's exactly right. How has it been for you as you've as you've gone like you're you're in this current role now where you're making this shift? Like how has how's it going? Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, I think that if I look back at the origin of untold content, it would have never been the company that it is today had I not been passionate about uh, being a leader from the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. I, I started off as a research professor and started consulting on the side. And that, that was just me uh, working independently on my own. And luckily, I had some incredible mentors, in particular, um, someone who, who sort of served as the, the prime government vendor for a, a subcontract that I was on uh, with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, she said to me, you know, Katie, you're, you're not under contract to have to do all of this by yourself. <laughs> you could, mm -hmm. you know, that you could actually hire people or con or sub con sub subcontract to others to help you achieve uh, the, the scope that they were asking and also keep your research agenda and your teaching going. And I thought that's brilliant. I can scale myself. That's amazing, <laughs> and uh, right. So, uh, in startup speak, that that's the that's a huge mindset shift to at least for me at the time. Right, it was sort of more in the professional services, um, you know, kind of definition, I guess, a, a, of a startup. But uh, and that shifted for Untold as we start to dream quite quite bigger. But. I, I know that in the beginning, it was it just became very important to me as I realized how much more was possible if I could create jobs for people, um, mm -hmm. if I could create opportunities, and uh, we could reach more clients that way. We could really help accomplish this this broader mission of being able to translate technical information in ways that all people can understand. Uh, it, it just that the, a larger vision came into play. And uh, the way it's going for me now is, is that I'm in a new role as we've, you know, scaled quite a bit over the last, you know, since our founding three years ago. And now I'm running a, a team of about seven and helping them think with with that kind of mindset is my current job as a leader so that we don't limit ourselves. Um, and, and also, too, identifying and really, again, to, to what you said, uh, which is helping people identify their strengths and their desires professionally, you know, so sort of understanding the value of people who are doing the work. You know, for us, it's really high level research writing and content creation. And um, we work with highly complex subject matter. And so, it, you know, in technical, scientific, medical fields. And so really res deeply respecting the work that's being done um, at the content level, at the research level, and not forcing everyone on the team to uh, need to scale themselves if that's not their professional trajectory, but also balancing that with uh, the vision to scale this this organization and um, the, the belief that with processes and practices and with really strong management, we can, uh, in fact, scale much more rapidly and be able to create even more jobs for more people and, uh, and get, you know, be able to, to work with, with more innovative organizations to, to support them and therefore accomplish our bigger mission. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm, in a, I'm in an interesting position now uh, of trying to really coach other 
other potential, you know, people who, uh, you know, in a startup, we, we sort of have this interesting choice, especially when when we're not um, at this point yet. We don't have the pressure of investors yet to, to have to force to scale. And so there's mm-hmm. there is sort of this like um, ability to decide how fast or slow we want to go. And mm-hmm. that can be a point of tension, too. So. It is, cool. It's super different in the startup world and deciding at what point to bring in, um, you know, larger investors and that sort of thing. And um, but I'm, yeah. I'm a very uh, sort of empathy led leader. And so thinking it, it, and really letting this company grow based on, to some degree, the talented people who make it and, and their visions too, combining our visions together and, and building something that I could never have imagined on my own. Right. So. Do you, do you, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm fascinated by the kind of like what, what you do when it comes to your business development slash sales process, like how much, how much of your selling or, or acquiring new clients happens because of you and your team's ability to tell stories, to tell effective stories? Um, I would say a hundred percent. It's either How does that. that go? Like, what does that sound like? I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. So, you know, just like with all effective storytelling in, in sales, it yeah. really is about meeting the need of, of the customer, the potential customer yeah. that you're speaking to. So, you know, it varies. Of course, we have to we have sort of different talking points depending on, you know, which which type of client we're, we're speaking to. But overarchingly, our our greatest story at Untold is that far too many of your organization's experts their insights are sort of left at the lab bench or at mm. the patient bedside, and there's not enough um, there, there's not enough thought leadership content coming out uh, of those individuals. and And if you are looking to become more innovative in terms of your public presence and the way that your customers or consumers understand your brand, then you really need to be harnessing the insights of your experts and. At the same time, too many experts really struggle to share their research and their data in ways that make sense to anybody else, right? And so um, we've worked for a long time with engineers and product designers and scientists and medical providers to help sort of create a bridge between research and development and, and some of those more subject matter expertise areas of organizations to translate what those individuals know and their insights to the sales and marketing team so that they can leverage that in conversations and and help produce thought leading content that's you know evidence based content that's a lot of what you know we do and there's so much need for that especially as there's more especially as there's you know increased transparency is a demand from consumers um, and and more and more leaders are um, are feeling pressure to make sure that they are communicating thought leadership and articulating the, the fact that they they are in fact innovative and they know the trends and they're on top of their game and so not really I think there's just this dual pressure now in a way that um, it is more uh, is a higher demand than ever where you don't just have to be great at the work and leading the work you also have to show thought leadership and project uh, that identity inside your organization and beyond. Makes so much sense. I Lo- love to hear it. Uh, thank you for answering that. Appreciate it. <laughs> I should practice my five second version. <laughs> I love it. No, it's long. cool. It's cool. It's cool. Well, I mean, that's not. It's not really. There's not. It, there's not a five second answer there. So I, I. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, so. Oh my goodness! I can't believe we only have one minute left. This time just flew by. But uh, you know, tell me what what do you think in terms of storytelling and the way that it matters, especially to innovation or to companies that kind of are encouraging us to look toward what to expect in the future. Well, I mean, I, I think it's one of the most effective tools in order to move people, and that's really what innovation's all about: making changes, effectively taking somebody from one place to another place. And if you can effectively tell that, tell that in the form of a story to get, whether you'd call it change management in the leadership world or what have you, but not, 
I've found that whether you can look in history, I mean, JFK, the, 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 the man on the moon speech at Rice University, right? Like what an effective story he told and the why behind that story. And there are countless examples like that that have really changed the course of many people's lives. And leaders have that ability to do that um, if they study and understand what storytelling is all about and that can really inspire innovation it can inspire change it can inspire people to move also as a leader the storytelling can build confidence in the people that you are leading it shows that you are a thoughtful person that you've done some deliberate work in trying to understand what the future holds right what are people most scared of they're scared of uncertainty and so leaders who can tell effective stories about what they want and see and think will happen moving forward have the ability to to excite and inspire people and i remember talking to marcus buckingham about this and he's like the leaders i want to follow can see around the corners i was like what do you what do you mean by that well they've done the necessary work that i'm not going to say that they can predict the future but they have a way about them that they that that builds confidence that they have a uh, they seem to have a better understanding of a, of what may happen moving forward than those who don't, and so that's why when 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 I'm asked what are qualities of effective leadership, I think being extremely thoughtful, reflecting, really understanding what's happening, and then being very intentional. And I think storytelling is plays a role in both of those of really thinking things through at a deep level and then being intentional with your actions following that careful thought and being intentional about the, the story that you are crafting for yourself as well as for the people that you're leading will make a massive difference in the success or failure of your team, of your company, of your business. And, and so that's why it's important for all of us as leaders to really think about that and be intentional in how we're crafting that narrative for ourselves and our teams. That's, that's completely right. I, I love that you're emphasizing the importance of reflection and deep consideration and thought. You know, once once a leader has identified uh, an important message or an important story to share, what are your thoughts on the best ways to communicate that? What, what sorts of goals do you think that leaders should be setting for themselves and uh, when it comes to the delivery of their stories? Well, I mean, th we've we've probably all seen some of the models out there. I, and I'll, I'll tell a quick story in order to, maybe we're getting meta here, but I remember when I had sent early drafts of my book to some some really good authors who had been guests on my podcast and they offered some really helpful feedback and one i remember in particular was a guy by the name of ryan holiday who's a fantastic writer he's written a number of books including uh the obstacle is the way ego is the enemy uh, and, and a number of others and ryan was was gracious enough to offer feedback and i had sent him an early draft of my book and he said I remember it was an email and then we had a follow-up phone call. He said, what are you doing? The story on page 43 should be on page one. You must grab them by the throat and make them want to continue to turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> and it and and what 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 that and it was a pretty harsh analogy uh, or metaphor, but what what he really meant is you have this great story and you're burying it in the middle. You should open with that story in your book. It'll 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 help people turn the page. And what that tells to me is when I am giving a keynote or writing a piece, don't be afraid to lead off with a compelling story that will make them really perk up and want to wait for the next word because really what are you doing as a speaker you're just trying to earn the right to 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 have your audience's attention for the next few minutes and so my keynotes whether they might be an hour long but i'm trying to earn the right every few minutes to hold their attention for a few more minutes when i'm writing a book i'm trying to earn the right to, to for, for that reader to turn the page to go to the next one and want to continue turning pages and so as from a storytelling perspective that's what it's all about if i if i understand the dynamics behind telling an effective story that makes people want to continue listening to my speeches or read my book or listen to my podcast um, that's what I have to do. And so I, I think having a hook, having something that maybe is a bit surprising to kick it off, 
uh, is one way to to understand the the, the power of 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 the the beginnings of things. And I always try to think of all right. Let me let me get to the beginnings of things on a regular basis. Uh, where I'm grabbing attention and then and then having the the dynamics of storytelling play play itself out through the course of of either speaking or writing that and I that's one memorable story in my life that has had an impact on me that I've tried to implement on a daily basis. I I love that advice. That is incredible. Yeah, there, there's a there's sort of a a thing called the serial position effect. This reminds me your advice reminds me of it. It's it's the idea that people will better remember the first thing they hear and the last thing they hear and the, the parts in the middle kind of get lost, but you've really got to hook and, and create something lasting and memorable at the start and the finish. Yeah, I, I agree. And then obviously there's there's conflict and you got to tap emotional nerves. And and I think you need to have a couple surprises along the way. And it's sometimes helpful to say, oh, wait, there's more. Right. And then there's a satisfying ending. I think those are some of the dynamics of the story. But it starts with understanding the the power of uh, of the fact that this is like when you're given a keynote. Uh, and I learned this very early on from speaking coaches, and so I'm lucky I did. I would typically go up there and say, oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And that's such a waste. You're wasting the, the such precious moments when you have all of their attention and you immediately just let them down by not having any type of surprise, no hook, nothing. You're just saying, oh, thanks so much. This is so great. What a, what a good venue we're at. And when you should go, Boom, right into the story or right into the moment immediately so that they're like, whoa, this is different. I got to perk up. I'm ready to go. And then from there, you you, you take off. But I, I don't like wandering into a speech if I'm going to go. And I've learned this the hard way by making mistakes. But but whether you're leading your team's meeting on Monday morning coming up or you're giving a keynote in front of thousands of people or you're writing a book, don't wander into it. Understand that that first initial moment is so important. It's so vital. Don't waste it. And most people do, but don't waste it. Don't wander in. Just go in like, okay, if you were writing, just delete the first paragraph and start with the second paragraph, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. Like that's that's one way I think of it. Oh, okay. I'm just going to get rid of that part. Yes. yes but it's, it's, it's much easier said than done though. We all have made, have made those mistakes and we'll make them in the future. But, but, but that's something to really be cognizant of when you're, when you're in the mode of, of leading a meeting or telling a story or even writing a book of don't waste that initial moment. You know, I, I love that example, though, that you originally had that story in the middle of, you know, on page 45 or whatever, yep. and, and you needed to pull it forward. I, I know that for my own writing process, isn't, this is something that I talk with clients about a lot, is you're oftentimes not going to know that first thing you need to say until you are 45 pages in or, or at least a few paragraphs in. Like oftentimes right. it's the conclusion that needs to then actually be the start of it all and, uh, and, and the recursive nature of writing and and of thought leadership we just we, it really i think it goes back to our uh to our advice about reps really it, it's don't just walk away with a shitty first draft and uh you know be okay with with allowing yourself to have a shitty first draft but you have to be willing to put in the reps and uh, and one really good strategy to remember is that you're probably going to say the smartest most interesting most surprising thing near the end yep you got to warm up a little bit when you're writing. You, know? you got it takes it takes some time to get to the good stuff. We're not unless you're one of those aliens who's really good right away, which is not me. Uh, it takes some time to to get to get it to get it going. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, you Ryan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. If you're inspired by today's conversation, you have got to check out the book Welcome to Management and Ryan's show, The Learning Leader Podcast. Ryan, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Uh, thanks for having me, Katie. It was great to talk with you. Uh, my website has pretty much everything, learningleader.com. Or if you happen to be listening on your phone, you can text the word learners to 44222. That's learners to 44222. And you get pretty much all of my stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure you have it all that way too. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. <laughs>